research. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Librarian Support for Using AI in STEM Research, sponsored by the Association of College and Research Libraries Science and Technology section. My name is Tessa Withhorn and I'm the co-chair of the STS Conference Program Planning Committee, and we have lots of other people from our committee here too helping us out today. Before I introduce our three panelists, I just want to make a few general announcements. Um, the Zoom settings should be all set up, but please do keep your mic muted during the session, and we'll be spotlighting our speakers so they should be the only faces that you see. The chat is available for comments and dialogue, as well as any links you'd like to share throughout the session, um, but please do add your questions for the panelists to the designated Q&A section in Zoom, which should be that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This will just help us see all the questions in one place. And uh, ALA sponsored events adhere to a code of conduct that does not tolerate harassment in any form. So if you experience anything you'd like to report, please just reach out to one of our hosts in a private message and we'll be sure to address that. We also have a live professional stenographer for our closed captions today. You should be able to toggle closed captions on and off using the CC or captions button that's also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and there also will be a link dropped in the chat in just a moment to where you can access the transcript in a new browser window and watch those captions in real time as well. If you do need any help or need any additional accommodations, again, just feel free to reach out to one of our hosts and we'll be able to help you out. So today we have three presenters with us. Um, I'll start with Melanie Ganey, who is a STEM librarian at Carnegie Mellon University, where she supports the biological sciences, computational biology, and biomedical engineering departments, and the Neuroscience Institute. She co-founded the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program at CMU Libraries in 2018. As director of the program, she advocates for open science and helps provide infrastructure, training, collaboration opportunities, and community building events for researchers at Carnegie Mellon and beyond. Prior to joining CMU Libraries in 2017, Melanie was a postdoctoral fellow in the Helens Wills Neuroscience Institute at UC Berkeley and received her PhD in neuroscience from Brandeis University in 2010. She uses her experience as a neuroscientist to inform her current work in supporting open research. Her other research interests include information and data literacy and evidence synthesis. And Glusker is a librarian at the University of California, Berkeley, serving as a liaison for four social science departments and the librarian for research methods. She has worked in medical, academic, special, and public libraries. Uh, before changing careers to librarianship, she spent a decade as an epidemiologist at Public Health Seattle and King County, working both as an analyst doing surveys and community assessment work and answering data requests from researchers, government officials, and the public. She has a PhD in sociology, demography, and a master's in public health and a Master of Library Science, all from the University of Washington in Seattle. While her dissertation focused on patterns of fertility and assimilation among immigrant women, her current research interests include data literacy, library morale, and library and career paths. And finally, we have Denise Lewis, who started at the Wake Forest University Z. Smith Reynolds Library in March 2019. She received her BS and MS in a electrical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and graduated with her MLS from Indiana University Purdue IUPUI in 2019. In between electrical engineering and library science, Denise picked up an Associates of Culinary Arts from Le Cordon Bleu Scottsdale. She's a member of the American Library Association, the Co Association of College and Research Libraries, and the North Carolina Library Association, and the American Society for Engineering Education. Denise's research interests are the digital information literacy skills of incoming students. We'll give each presenter about seven minutes to present on an aspect of the top, topic that they choose, followed by four prepared questions that we have, and then we'll have plenty of time for audience Q&A at the end. So we'll go ahead and start with Melanie. Thank you, Tessa. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about how our STEM researchers at CMU are using AI and what we are doing in the libraries to support that work. Uh, next. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the CMU Cloud Lab, which is a brand new automated science lab. It is the first of its kind in an academic institution. Um, so basically the way this works is that researchers can put lines of code into their computer and then um, robots assisted by human technicians at a facility in Pittsburgh will do the experiments. It supports uh, life science experiments and chemistry experiments. Um, next. CMU Libraries has been in partnership with CMU Cloud Lab for a few years now to help open up the research, and we're really excited about the potential of the Cloud Lab to make um, benchwork science more accessible and reproducible. 
um, one thing we're specifically working on right now is integrating the Cloud Lab databases with our institutional repository, Kilt Hub. We know that a lot of the researchers using it will have NIH funding, and so we want to make data sharing as easy for them as possible, as well as encourage those without NIH funding to share their data as well. Um, so basically, a researcher will be able to just put a few lines of code into the Cloud Lab interface to send their data to the repository, as well as auto-populate uh, sections of the README documentation as well. Next. Um, this is a paper that came out last winter um, in Nature, and it's from one of the faculty members in the chemistry department at CMU who is using the Cloud Lab. And he basically um, took the automated science technologies of the Cloud Lab and then applied LLMs to that as well to create an AI system called CoScientist. Co-scientists can autonomously design, plan, and execute chemistry experiments. And so it um, basically allows a researcher to use natural language to fully automate that workflow. And um, whereas normally you have to use lines of code to use the Cloud Lab, it will really um, help democratize uh, the use of automated labs with LLMs. Next. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a semi-regular event we hold called the Collaborative Bioinformatics Hackathon. This is done in partnership with Ben Busby, who is a principal scientist at a bioinformatics company called DNA Nexus in Silicon Valley. And in the last iteration of this in the fall, we focused on topics related to deep learning and LLMs. Next. We had over 40 scientists and student researchers joining us from around the world, both virtually and in person, and they delved into these topics related to comparing the capability of various publicly available LLMs to answer biomedical queries. So, for example, their ability to extract from abstracts um, the relationships between genetic mutations and their disease associations. Um, they then fine-tuned an existing LLM with knowledge graph to improve its ability to answer these queries. Um, and we really emphasize openness at the event. So that fine-tuned LLM is publicly available on Hugging Face. All of the code is on GitHub, and the work is described in a preprint on Biohack Archive. Um, DNA Nexus very generously provided compute for this event. And one thing we were excited was that some of the students, particularly master students, had said that they had not really had the opportunity to use LLMs in a computationally intensive way before. So we were really happy to be able to provide that opportunity for them. Next. We do a lot of work to support um, learning how to code in open source languages, Python and R. And so um, this is work building on that. So our open science postdoctoral associate, Kristen Scotty, has developed and taught a workshop that um, teaches people how to use AI chatbots to facilitate coding in Python. So she covers things like how to use it to understand Python syntax, debug the code, write comments, and how to use it to help translate code from a proprietary language such as MATLAB into Python. Next. And then finally, um, we're also um, working on applying AI to evidence synthesis. So I'm part of our evidence synthesis team. And together with my colleague, Sarah Young, who um, leads our evidence synthesis program, we worked with Liz Wayne in biomedical engineering to um, answer this question about how cancer nanomedicine targets macrophages. We retrieved over 18,000 studies, and we use machine learning to automatically exclude thousands of those titles and abstracts in a data extraction platform called CISREF. Uh, the graduate students also use topic modeling to classify the abstracts into um, the types of cancer and nanomedicine represented. Um, and they found that you could use this topic modeling even for new papers add to the data set. So there's potential to use this method in a living review context as well. Next. And then this summer, we'll be turning our attention into how you use LLMs to automate screening for evidence synthesis. So we have colleagues in the Vice Provost for Education's office who are working on this question of how reflection exercises um, impact student learning, which is broadly applicable to education, but also to STEM. Um, and so we'll work with them to evaluate a couple of different methods for automating screening with large language models this summer. Um, so thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Melanie. We'll have Anne next. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I will be talking about health-related research and librarians. There is a li link to the slides. I think that will be put in the chat as well. Next slide. N next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of an outline of what I'm going to be going over. I'm currently a social sciences librarian, so I'm not as close to the content as maybe the other two presenters. So it's going to be a little bit of a upper level view, although I was a medical librarian for six years. So um, I do feel a lot of um, love for the content. Next slide. So I wanted to just start a little bit with a timeline of AI in healthcare. Um, the term AI was originated in 1956, um, but the Turing test, which looks at the degree to which machines match human intelligence came before that. Turing was a famous coder in Great Britain in World War II. Um, you can even think about the punch card machine as having an algorithmic decision-making component. Um, but then in the 80s and 90s, it took off. Um, radiology was an early adopter. And if you look at this inset, you can see that um, if a radiologist can look at 225,000 uh, scans in a career, AI could really uh, take that a lot further. And so it was very attractive to radiologists. But since then, um, pretty much there's an AI literature for any any specialty area or health profession. Um, it's really taken off. It's a very complex landscape. I was asked to talk about it a little bit um, in a Berkeley presentation. And um, if you identify yourself as a physician and go into Google and talk, ask about AI, you get hit with uh, hundreds of proprietary pro uh, products. Um, so it's, it's very, very well established in healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to just kind of make the point that there are clinical and research applications, and they're quite different. Um, I'm not going to read these examples, but you can take a look at them later if you want. But on the left hand was a group of physicians at Johns Hopkins University that developed a uh, real-time tool during the COVID pandemic to um, assess risk using patient records that fed into an algorithmic decision-making model. Um, and then on the right hand side are researchers that were looking at genetic activity and the AI helps them determine patterns in the data that would be too difficult for them to extract otherwise. So it, it was a really, really a boon for their research. So two very different kinds of activity happening in the healthcare sphere. One thing to be very, very careful to note is that most AI tools at this point are not considered HIPAA compliant from what I've been reading. Next slide, please. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide either, but I wanted to make the point that there's a lot of activity in the realm of translational research, which is the um, enterprise where they're, they're, you're trying to get that bench science quickly to the bedside, so from bench to bedside, um, and how to kind of make the research findings applicable to clinical work as soon as possible. But I also wanted to include this quote because I like algorithm of vigilance and there's a link to a, an article about it. It's actually quite interesting. Next slide. Um, so moving into the sphere of libraries, um, the National Library of Medicine, which is a division of the National Institutes of Health, is actually doing much more than I expected. I'm kind of proud of them. Um, I used to be an employee. Um, of the, the different ways that they're using AI and other algorithmic tools to work on the, the kinds of uh, problems that are faced by its patrons. One is trial GBT, which is using large langu language models to predict patient eligibility for clinical trials. Um, you might want to take a look. They found that it wasn't doing as well as they hoped because the tool lacked medical reasoning. And that led me to another article, which I have linked here, that um, AI was found to be more empathetic than physicians in some cases. But anyway, the point of this is that the NLM is really taking a lot of action in this realm. Next slide, please. So moving on to then how we in our own libraries can help researchers. Um, my first uh, point is to keep an open mind. So I think many of us, our first reaction was, um, how are we going to monitor the hallucinations and the confabulations and the bad information coming out of AI? But there are a lot of benefits as well. So for any given task, you might want to sort of come up with a benefit and risk analysis. This one comes from uh, Gregory Lehner, who does systematic review work at NYU. He gave a fantastic presentation for the Medical Library Association, and this was his kind of benefit risk calculus of using AI in systematic reviews. Next slide, please. Um, and then this list, you know, I, I won't 
sort of really delve into it too much, you'll have the slides, but are some ideas of how to be thinking about approaching our work with AI with our patrons. Um, very important point is to understand how AI is integrated into the tools that we're using, and that is a shifting landscape. It requires staying up to date. Um, there are many discipline-specific trends we want to keep uh, up with. I think that we should be proactive. So I was really interested to see some of the things that Melanie and colleagues are already doing. I'm sure Denise and colleagues are as well. Um, but one thing that I cannot stress enough is that you need to be practicing the tools. And there are a lot of use cases in our own work. So if you're sort of thinking of doing assessment work, um, think about incorporating AI so that you get more comfortable with the tools because you can't really talk about them unless you've at least been exposed in some way. Next slide, please. Um, for keeping up to date, I think we librarians are sort of used to that idea and are um, know how to do all the alerts and stuff. I do highly recommend that you consider doing that for AI topics. Um, I've been attending a lot of trainings recently, and so the list of um, tools to check out that here, the substacks, et cetera, come from those trainings. Um, I personally subscribe to that bottom one, the TLDR AI newsletter. It's really good. I recommend it. Uh, and then next slide. So I'm just gonna flip through these next slides pretty quickly because I have one minute left and they are all just resource listings. And so you can check those out later. Um, trainings, um, definitely think about YouTubes if you need any kind of basic information. There's some really good ones. I have a few links here. Um, next, I have some articles that I came across while I was doing this presentation. I think that you'll find some interesting content here as well. And then finally, I think this is the most fun slide. All the trainings I've been to, people just, the chat was buzzing with this tool and that tool and the other tool, and they're pretty interesting. So if you came in today's session wanting to create your own AI, here's some links for you. Um, really, really fun to explore. Next slide. So thank you all. Um, sorry, I went so fast. There was so much content to give you. Um, I look forward to your questions and please be in touch if I can help at all. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And then we'll have Denise. We'll just take Denise a second to get her slides up. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and get started. So I'm just gonna to touch on a little bit about who I am, how I got involved in AI, as well as how I'm using AI tools for research and then future plans regarding AI tools. <clears throat> so other than being an avid bibliophile called Denise, yes, my mother um, punched me when I was growing up by taking away my library card. Um, I talked a little bit about my education. I'm a fourth career librarian in that um, after I got my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering, I worked in industry with software development, testing and training. Um, and then worked as a chef, <laughs> did my externship at Epcot. Um, and then after I got my MLIS, um, started working at Wake. Um, and I noticed that I worked everywhere except for nonprofits. So I worked for the government as well as an in industry, as well as in academia um, at a few different colleges and universities. So when we talk about how I got involved in AI, it was back in the fall of 2021, there was a PhD physics student um, who couldn't find a particular article in Web of Science um, and wanted to know where can I find the citations for this particular article and did some research and came across um, site.ai. Um, and although I told him it was free, it's like, it's not free. It's not free. <laughs> um, and then also I was developing and teaching a course, Information Literacy for Engineering in the spring of 22, um, and when I checked to see who was registered for the course, nine out of the 11 students were graduating seniors. And I tend to teach to who's ever sitting in front of me. Um, so I made some changes to ensure that um, some of the tools that we were covering um, were ones that they could get to after graduation. Um, and then one of the big things that caused me to deep dive into AI tools um, is I was a part of the 2022 cohort for the Institute for Research and Design and Librarianship, RADL, and starting my own research um, using AI tools definitely was helpful. Um, in terms of how I'm using and sharing AI tools for research, um, definitely shared it in the course that I taught. I had one class that was looking at the intersection of AI tools um, at intersection of AI, data science, and information literacy. 
um, and basically shared um, like site.ai with the students, um, as well as um, Citation Gecko, um, which uses co-citations, um, along with um, Connected Papers, which uses both co-citations and bibliographic coupling. Um, and then I forgot, Open Knowledge Maps, <laughs> another AI tool. Um, and then uh, I also demo different AI tools um, at Wake during um, my one shots or bibliographic sessions. So um, in this particular example, this was um, a session that I had um, with a chemistry bio class. Um, and not only did I demo Primo, which is our library discovery interface, SciFinder and PubMed, but also demoed site.ai for the students since we had a trial um, and we since adopted it here at Wake. Um, then um, definitely share as far as what different AI tools that I'm using with research. Um, I was a part, I did the physics colloquium um, this past semester or in the fall, um, basically on improving your research workflow um, with AI tools. Um, and then in personal research sessions with students that I meet with, be it undergraduate students, graduate students, um, faculty or researchers. Um, in this case, this is my sister who finished up her EDD. So I shared with her site, um, Elicit and Research Rabbit. So in terms of my future plans for AI tools and STEM research, um, uh, one of the things that we're doing at Wake are peer-to-peer -peer seminars. Um, our Center for the Advancement of Teaching um, director, Betsy Barr, is very gung-ho about ChatGPT, um, and as a result, has become very gung-ho about AI tools and instruction. So we're actually doing peer-to-peer -peer seminars where um, different individuals who've signed up are teaching um, faculty from their lens. So my particular lens is integrating AI tools into your research and instruction. Um, and then I'll also be writing a book chapter. <laughs> One of the book chapters that I'm writing is um, uh, it's going to be integrating AI tools into the STEM research process. And that is it for moi. Hey, thank you so much, Denise. I'm just going to share a screen with our pre um, created questions and just give us a second to have all of our panelists be back in the spotlight. Um, and then they'll have the opportunity to address these questions. So if we're ready, um, we'll start with this first question. As librarians, what services or resources or professional practices have changed in supporting AI researchers? Anyone who wants to go first is welcome to. I mean, I'll just say that one thing that I is am finding different about working with AI questions is that there's not an established group of offices or services campus wide. So if it's just research data management, there are various places that I can refer people and I know what they'll get there and how they'll be helped. And um, these are well established services. But for AI, I feel like sort of everybody's still quite uncertain about how to help people. I don't know if, if you're finding that, Denise and Melanie. Yeah, here at Wake, um, I wouldn't necessarily nervously say that our um, services or resources have changed. Now, one of the things that our library did do, we do had, did have like two openings due to individuals um, finding other positions. So our library did do an assessment analysis of, do we want to basically um, rehire for those two positions or rehire um, in different areas. So we did decide to use one of the positions for um, a data services librarian. Um, but in terms of AI, since as a university, sort of kind of, I wouldn't say we've adopted AI because um, instructors are allowed to decide how they want to use AI in and outside the classroom. Um, and there are different individuals um, in terms of researchers that are using AI in a variety of different ways. Um, but we don't necessarily have an AI focus at Wake in terms of a degree. Um, so it's a matter of people deciding what AI tools they want to utilize and how they want to use it, um, either in their research instruction or for productivity. Um, yeah, I'll just say I agree with all of that. And it is evolving so rapidly. So as Anne was saying, it's, um, you know, we have 
tools we point people to, but they might not be relevant in six months or there might be a better option. So that obviously feels different than, yeah, some of the more traditional services. We do have um, site.ai as well and Kenius. So we use that a lot in our information literacy instruction now. Um, and then the Cloud Lab is such a big initiative for Carnegie Mellon that we are doing a needs assessment right now to try to understand where are all the places that the library can help support those researchers. So our next question, which some of you have addressed in your presentations, but if you want to expand on this, what AI tools are being used in the research domains you support and what problems do these tools address? So I use a gazillion. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't use that. Um, one of the first that I did adopted was site.ai, and site.ai can be used from a variety of different perspectives. So from both forward and backward citation searching to get a sort of kind of glimpse of what's being said um, in a particular research area um, to keep abreast of new um, research you can create like a dashboard and it'll send you an email with new articles um, for that particular area. You can even upload, um, say, a draft of your article um, with your bibliography work cited. And I'll let you know if any of the um, citations um, have any errata associated with it. Um, and then site also has a beta like site assistant that you can basically type a research question or a topic um, and it'll give you um, like a response with inline citations and references where it's pulling the information from. Um, insightful research rabbit connected papers, um, lit maps, <laughs> 2D search, um, iris.ai. Um, yeah, those are some of the, in the list, that, those are some of the top ones. But we've adopted site.ai at Wake and we're trialing Elicit currently. But the, everything, they address everything from being able to write a research question and get a list of scholarly resource sources to being able to find additional resource sources for an esoteric topic, being able to conduct a literature review um, fairly quickly, um, and being able to 2D search, being able to search in a multiple um, areas um, using a uh, visual interface to develop a search stream. Uh, one thing that I've seen that's kind of interesting, it's not exactly an AI tool, but I went to a presentation recently, and I just, I'm putting the link in the chat, about um, UC Irvine is creating its own chat GPT for its campus. Um, and so students are able to get to chat GPT and Gemini and other AI tools through that campus. Um, I'm blanking on the word I want, but, you know, sponsored or approved tool. But the thing in the presentation that I went to that I found very interesting was that it said that it could support highly sensitive data. So one thing that's of concern is that you don't want people um, not understanding that if they're feeding data and privacy related concerning information into AI tools, they're getting sucked up and becoming part of that AI tool. And so this campus has kind of developed a way that people can work in a more safe environment with their data. I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it's, uh, they're, they've made their code available. And I think a lot of other institutions, as you're saying, Jamie, are, are going to be coming up with this kind of solution. Um, yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're using it to facilitate coding, as I mentioned in my presentation. Um, so I'm really excited about this workshop that Kristen Scotty is doing, um, because we were members of the Carpentries for many years, held a lot of foundational coding in R and Python workshops, and have since adapted that content into our own workshop series. And what we see a lot of at Carnegie Mellon is that um, a lot of people have, you know, some coding experience, but they often don't they're often missing some of this foundational knowledge related to how you troubleshoot code, um, how you, um, yeah, translate the code from one language to another, those types of things that um, are increasingly relevant as people are trying to move from proprietary languages to open source languages. And so um, her workshop, I think a lot of people know that you can use ChatGPT to help with code, but they don't quite know 
what it's capable of or what its limitations might be. And so she works them through a bunch of hands-on examples. Um, and, and sometimes it doesn't do the task very well. So I think that's also very informative for the students to see where it's not performing very well. And um, I'm, I myself am a novice coder. And so I've actually found chat GPT to be incredibly useful for helping me code in R. Um, and so I, I, I really hope that this helps our learners at CMU feel more confident with foundational coding. Great. And Denise, I see your comment in the chat about downloading large language models. Do you want to expand on that any? Yeah, there are um, different um, open access um, large language models that you can download um, and actually just utilize it with documents on your computer um, where it's not being uploaded to an actual large language model. Um, I think the key is to um, sort of kind of help people to understand um, not only sensitive data, don't add it to a large language model, but there are different AI tools that you can upload PDF files, um, but also help them to understand that if you're uploading a PDF file, you want to ensure that you're using an open access PDF file, unless you know um, the contractual agreement for that particular publisher or journal, because there are more publishers are starting to add um, an AI clause where you can't upload um, any of the articles or resources um, with AI, because even though we've trialed Elicit, one of the functions of Elicit that we're going to be um, sort of kind of removing is the ability to upload a PDF um, because of some of the um, publisher agreements that we have. We can go on to our next slide in just a moment, but another relevant comment came up. Is there concern about quality assurance with taking code generated by an AI tool? And Melanie answered, but do you want to expand on that more, Melanie? Sure. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, and so Kristen does cover you know, ways you can validate your code. And what's interesting about that is that I think a lot of people don't that we get in these workshops don't know how to do that, even in the context of not using a chatbot. And that's an important skill is to make sure that code is doing what you think it's doing. So that does provide this opportunity to teach that foundational skill that some of these learners have never picked up anyway. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very important aspect of coding with chatbots. And then our third question, what evaluation criteria or techniques do you use to measure one AI tool against another? In case it helps in my slides, there are some links to tools which actually literally let you do uh, sort of enter your prompts or prompt engineering using different tools all in the same interface. Um, I've used that a few times. I actually tend to look for user forums more often and sort of throw the question out, like, if you wanted to do such and such a task, which AI tool would you use? And people definitely have opinions. Yeah, I'll sometimes like have try to create a standardized set of benchmark prompts to put into various competitor products to see how well it does for like the same prompt. Um, but like I said, I think one of the challenges is that you do that and then it feels like it might immediately be out of date. Um, so you have to kind of keep returning to that evaluation process, um, which is just this really interesting thing about AI right now. Which is another reason that people are tending to do things like date when they did their search. Because you don't get the yeah, same search twice I in a row. Yeah. Oops, sorry. No, 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 go, go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't have an established criteria because there are different tools that I use that do different things. Um, but mainly I'm looking for accuracy, accuracy relevance if it's um, a tool um, that's searching for um, resources. Um, if it's a tool that's generating images, I'm looking at where, how is it developing those images? Is it pulling from... Um, uh, create, you know, is it pulling from an image that has a Creative Commons license or is it, how is it, you know, um, I'm looking at how is it working behind the scenes. Um, I'm reading the terms of agree the terms of services and their privacy agreement because I want to know where is the information stored and how is it stored and if I can delete it or erase it. 
or change the settings so that, you know, there's a privacy setting there. But it, the value, yeah, so it varies depending on the tool and what I'm using it for. But if I'm comparing two tools to one, one another, I'll literally run through um, the same test for each of the tools um, to see compare functionality. Great. Millie, did you get to answer that question or I'm sorry, I didn't want to, okay, we'll move on to our last prepared question. So please feel free as we are having conversations to add your own questions to the Q&A. Uh, but how do you see AI tools being licensed or incorporated into existing campus or library license platforms? A few of, a few of you addressed this already, but if you want to expand on that. So the, okay. <laughs> The funny thing is, is like for site, um, they charge um, per FTE. However, if you're a member of, and I forget the, the group off the top of my head, you get a 50% off discount. However, for illicit, um, we negotiated that because for illicit to charge by F -type FTE, the way that it works is you're buying a number of credits. And if we looked at FTE, we'd have been buying millions of credits and it's like, <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> um, although the credits do um, carry over from year to year. Um, looking at the adoption of new tools, like even with Site, when we trialed it, there were 50 people that used it um, that spring semester during the trial because we trialed it for six months. Um, and if you look at two years later, how many individuals are using Site? Um, the last time I looked at it earlier this semester, it was only 450 people. So I think in terms of licensing um, AI software to adopt as a university, um, it's a matter of really looking at how is it going to be utilized um, in your particular school? Is it going to be a singular department? Is it going to be open to everyone? Um, but the FTE model doesn't necessarily translate depending on um, how, what you're paying for and how you're paying for it. Um, and there are certain databases that are, are baiting currently um, an AI interface in terms of search, um, like Scopus, um, Elsevier, and I forget the third database off the top of my head. Um, but in terms of LISs, some of them are already using AI on the back end, but ne not necessarily visible on the front end on the search. I mean, for me, the thing that concerns me is not seeing the AI tools being incorporated into databases and other platforms that we already have. So like in the trainings I've been going to recently, they're sort of saying things like, oh, well, Covenants uses some AI uh, calculating processes. I had not realized that. And I'm, I'm just sort of assuming, you know, when you go through your daily life, I mean, suddenly in Google, you're going to get an AI result at the top of your result screen and it, these things kind of creep in. So I do wonder if there's some sort of diligence or investigations we should all be doing about how have tools changed that we have not realized and what's going on um, behind the scenes that may be AI generated. I'm kind of concerned about that because if 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 you're doing a process and it's not transparent to you what's happening, how can you claim um, any kind of reliability for the response? Let alone reproducibility, because you know you'll get a different AI answer each time you you try to do a query. Um, yeah, we license a handful of things. That I think have AI on the front end. Um, like I mentioned, site.ai and Kinius. Um, also a lot of things that have it on the back end and that's less clear. But then we also license quite a few open source tools in our library. Um, so Zotero is an example. And there's so many plugins now that people have created that incorporate AI capabilities. And so like one project I have for myself this summer is to <laughs> compare all of the Zotero plugins um, to see which ones would be worth recommending to the people in my departments, because I think that's something that people are broadly interested in. Um, so it's, that's like a whole nother element that's 
hard to keep up with as well. Great. Well, those were all our prepared questions. I see a few in the Q&A. The first one is, do you know if researchers mention in their publications methodology section that they use AI tools to help with their research? And Denise answered over text, but if you want to say out loud what, what you said or expand on that, Denise and others can chime in too. Yeah, different publishers have different requirements for AI use. Um, there are some publishers that outright will not, don't allow it. Um, but some will allow it, but you just have to state how you use it. Um, funnily enough, if you go to Web of Science and you search for Chat GPT as an author, there are some articles <laughs> and a thingy piece that actually has Chat GPT as an author. But yeah. Wow. Um, the thing I was going to say that has been interesting for me is I'm on an editorial board of a journal, I assist quarterly, and we're really struggling right now. Um, in order to be indexed in Scopus, you need to have a publication ethics and malpractice statement. And so we're trying to create that from scratch. But looking at what examples we can find in other journals, AI is much more rarely noticed, uh, mentioned than you would think. It was noticeable how little often it was explicitly called out in journal instructions for authors. And so hopefully that will be something that changes because um, I think the expectation is that you'd be transparent about AI use. Um, yeah, I think in terms of um, people using chatbots for writing, I've mostly seen it acknowledged as like fixing up the grammar, which is typically like an approved use of it for the science journals. Um, but interestingly, like I did see a paper recently from Carnegie Mellon where they had used AI and in the data sharing statement, they were only sharing part of what they were doing and said they were waiting for federal regulations on AI uh, to share the rest of it. So I think that that, you know, also opens up a lot of questions about um, the sharing of the algorithms and whatnot um, when people are using it for research rather than just writing a manuscript. And we had another question. Is there a concern, personal or professional, about the environmental cost or inequity of access when practicing, testing, or teaching repeat, repeat, repetitively, I'm sorry, <laughs> with these tools? I mean, I'm very concerned about inequity of access because the, the idea that many of the tools, well, not many, but at least some of the big ones are going behind paywalls. And so there's kind of already a setup division between those that have the free version and those that have the paid version. Um, you know, if you're at an institution that's paying for you to have the paid version, great, but um, the results are going to be different. The training of, of the models is going to be different. Um, I, I just think it's a problem. If we're interested in open science and open access, I think it's a big problem. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. I think there's like a lot of exciting possibilities for um, accessibility. Like when you can take things that normally rely on code and change that into natural language, that's that should make things more accessible. But then I completely agree with Anne that when you have the better models behind paywalls, um, that obviously is does present a lot of problems for equity. Yeah, so there it, it is known that as far as a lot of the um, AI tools that are that have been developed or not tools, but the chips themselves, the semiconductor chips um, actually utilize more electricity um, than others. But the way that I think about that, if you think about what um, an actual computer looked like in the 50s and 60s, the fact that it took up an entire room um, and you think about our smartphones now um, that are the palm of my hand or that literally fit your hand. <laughs> um, I'm for sure with a lot of the research that's being done um, with regards to nanotechnology, um, as well as with efficiencies in um, energy storage, et cetera, et cetera, um, that that's something that can be resolved in the next 10 to 15, if not less. Um, more than likely it'll be less. Um, definitely always concerned with regards to inequity of access. 
Um, that's why I usually try with whatever tools that I find um, to always make sure that I find um, a free as well as a paid version. Um, it's one of the, the first <laughs> AI presentation that I did um, was to the North Carolina Community Colleges Association um, in terms of finding um, open access or free tools um, to replace SciFinder in and um, Web of Science functionality. So it, it's a matter of knowing that I'm privileged per se to be able to work at a private university where the library's budget um, continues to grow. And the only time it flatlined was during the COVID lockdown. Um, but if I'm talking to um, high school students, say for the LEAP program or for um, other presentations, I always try to make sure again that I have that free as well as that paid version. Um, Great. Well, we had, uh, please feel free to continue putting your questions in the Q&A. We had one more uh, question that the committee thought about, and this is a little bit more philosophical, but do you see AI as a tool, an expert, a consultant, or what role do you see AI playing in your environment? I feel like it should be a tool, but I feel like people are treating it as an expert, and it really scares me. I just really... It's so great for so many things, but I feel like we are giving it too much power in our minds. Yeah, I would say I think of it as a tool or an assistant. Um, like I think of it as like facil facilitating a lot of processes, but again, would be nervous about it being referred to as an expert. I see it as all three. <laughs> No, because I see it as a tool that you can use in order to, um, in a variety of different ways, definitely as an assistant in terms of helping with findability, helping with productivity um, and time savings. Um, I see it as an expert because in looking at some of the things that um, certain AI tools are able to do, especially with um, analyzing volumes of data, um, it's it's going to do it faster and more accurate. Um, there are studies that have actually shown that um, over time. So is it is AI an expert in everything? No. <laughs> oh no. Um, expert in some things, yes. Because remember, you know, you think back to 1996 when Deep Blue beat um, the reigning chess champion at the time. Um, so there have been examples of AI being an expert in the past as well as in now. We got one new question and I was thinking something similar. So are you using AI teaching with undergraduate students? If so, how? And maybe we could also think about, you know, what is AI literacy to you and how do you teach AI literacy to various audiences? So I um, teach AI to undergraduates and it's more like a custom thing. Um, like one of the courses that um, I do a one shot in is um, engineering 212 transport phenomena. Um, it's where the students can pick an engineering system and what they have to do is to be able to research the changes in design of that engineering system, um, look at how it's utilized, also do a detailed analysis, both quantitatively and qualitatively, um, and then basically do a market analysis for how that tool um, will change in the future. Um, so what I do is I get the list of names from the instructor, um, put it in a PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, in Excel, um, to capture all of the engineering systems that the students are working on. But then I ask them um, informally, uh, do you consider yourself a novice, an expert, or somewhere in between um, for Primo, Web of Science, Engineering Workbench, um, and SciFinder in? Because um, that allows me to see where are they on the, <laughs> in terms of um, the tools that they've used for research before. Um, and then I literally teach the session based off of, and using as examples when I'm searching some of the engineering systems that they've mentioned. Um, and depending on some of the questions, I may pull in um, site.ai, 
um, to help them to answer a particular question um, or some other AI tools, um, just all depending. So that's a particular class that I don't necessarily teach the same AI tool to every class session because I'm focusing on teaching the students that are sitting in front of me. Um, but I am thinking about teaching um, a class on um, integrating AI into your research, um, more targeted for graduate students and undergraduate. Um, but for undergraduate students, what I found is that they don't want to be overwhelmed with a variety of tools. But if you show them a tool that they can use for their particular project or assignment in a particular way, then they're all on board. <laughs> Um, but the key is to show them how they use it in class, as well as have um, additional references that they consult afterwards, or open the door that they have the ability to meet with you after class one-on-one um, -on -one if they have any additional questions, be it a discussion forum or face-to-face -face or Zoom, but having that ability to contact Um, I'm going to be teaching an undergraduate course this fall, and it's kind of largely about advanced searching. So we are going to be trying to incorporate AI um, into that as much as possible. And so I think we're going to be covering um, how to look for synonyms in the chatbots for search strings, how to translate uh, search string syntax for one database to another, um, using Research Rabbit for citation tracing and then um, Kenius for lit searching as well. So um, this will be my first time uh, really doing undergraduate focused instruction since AI has rolled out. So, or the, the chatbots have rolled out. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I have not taught undergraduates directly. There are others in my both in my division and in our instruction services division that do do that teaching. Um, but one thing that I have done that I encourage everyone to do if it's of interest is in every single thing I present, I have some slides about AI. So I'm, it's not like I'm doing some separate thing, but I'm absolutely incorporating it into everything I do where possible. Great, well, I'll just wait a few minutes to see if there are any other questions in the Q&A, but I am gonna go ahead and drop the names and emails of our wonderful panelists today. Um, also, as a note, we will be sharing their slides formally after the session um, to all of those of you who have registered. Um, we also have just a really brief evaluation form that we'd like to, for you to fill out about this webinar. Um, so please take a moment to do that before you leave. Otherwise, I think we can thank our panelists. And again, thank you to the Science and Technology Conference Planning Committee for setting this up. Um, and yeah, we'll, is there anything else that the panelists would like to share in the five minutes that we have left? Can I, I, I think I just want to make one more comment about prompt engineering, how I kind of had not really gotten at the beginning how much of a thing it was, but the link that I just put in the chat with the, the game, it, it, you want to get to the next level of the game, of course, but it makes you actually have to think about what you're doing with your prompts and you actually watch your prompts not work. And I think it's, a really good thing for us all to be thinking about because when I sort of say that I don't want the tools to sort of take us over, but I want us to be the driver and them to be the tool. Um, if you can do good prompts and understand how the prompts are working and how they'll, you can get to the answer you want, it gives you so much control and power. It's really worth spending some time on, I think. Yeah, I just encourage everyone to find your AI lane um, and then make sure that you're setting aside a time, setting aside time to continually learn and keep up to date with what's going on because um, things are changing very fast um, and the rules per se <laughs> in terms of um, federal laws, policies and things of that nature, even in publishing are even changing and fluid. So um, take advantage of the newspaper subscriptions that you may have um, at your college, university, or library to stay up to date.
Yeah. And to add on to that, I, one thing that's been really useful for me is I usually read the news sections of science and nature journals. I feel like they've been covering a lot of the trends in publishing um, with AI and also just kind of like some of the kind of like more cutting edge stuff people are doing with the technology. So that's been really useful for me. Great. Well, thank you. Give uh, a round of applause to our panelists and uh, look forward to the slides later on and be sure to tune in to many other programs that I'm sure STS will lead around conversations of AI. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you.